linear regression using SPSS. Linear regression, uh, also known as ordinary least squares, is at the heart of making predictions in statistics when applied to international relations. It provides two general instruments. It creates a prediction equation, which allows us to input values in the independent variables and make a prediction on the dependent variable. It also gives us a proportion of variance explained, the R squared. It tells us how powerful our model is by telling us how much of the dependent variable is predicted by variance in the independent variables. So the math we're going to be using is identical to that which we saw in the hand regression process, but the computer will be doing all of the calculations. And we'll be covering multiple linear regression, which means we'll be looking at a model in which there are multiple independent variables used to predict the uh, dependent variable's outcome. Now, unlike the hand regression, this is a more involved process because for the linear regression to be valid, we have to satisfy some diagnostics before we run the regression, and we have to confirm other diagnostics after we run the regression. So here you can see the uh, SPSS empty, currently uh, not loaded with any uh, data set. General rule, save frequently. Make backups of your data set. SPSS is a capricious and old program. It doesn't like to share. So if you have your data set in Excel, save the file, close Excel, and then open the file in SPSS, and you're going to avoid uh, some problems. So let's go get the data set. File, open, data. Now the data we're going to collect is not from SPSS. It's actually from an Excel file. These files are all available on the website. Now, when we open up an Excel file, it's going to query us to confirm that the first line on top of the Excel sheet where the names are, the first row, will be uh, inserted as the variable names for SPSS. When you open an SPSS file, it'll be instantaneous. You won't have this intermediate step. So this is the data set. This is the Correlates of War data set from 1816 to 1991. It's got 2,042 cases. Each case is here uh, numbered on the left, and it's an entire row. And you can see if we bring it all the way down, we've got 2,000 uh, cases. That's a lot of cases of uh, MIDs. These are militarized interstate dispute data set for almost uh, 200 years. Each variable is a column. So these are different measures of the different cases and there's quite a few variables here, not all of which we're going to use. So the model that we want to examine here, we want to know how the hostility level of a crisis and to what extent reciprocity, which is the action-reaction process between two sides, and the level of fatalities produces an outcome. All right, now to tell you how we interpret the values, the outcome here uh, ranges between 1 and 8, where 1 and 2 is clear victory, 3 and 4 is one side or the other side yielding, and 5 through 8 is increasing levels of indecisiveness, in other words, uh, a stalemate or a standoff. Reciprocity is measured as a dummy variable. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but it means if there's reciprocity, the mass is valued at minus 1, and if there is no reciprocity, uh, it's valued at zero. Hostility is the standard MID measurement. It goes from one to five, where five is war, and one is no militarized action, two is threat to use force, three is display of force, and four is the use of force. And finally, we have fatality, which has a six-point scale from zero to six. Zero means no fatalities. Six means over 999 deaths, meaning at least 1,000 deaths and uh, 1 through 5 are intermediate ranges of those values. Now, if you're getting your own data, you would have to type in the data here with the variables uh, as the columns and the cases uh, as each of the rows. If you had data from different units such as countries or, or uh, uh, other units of analysis that are not associated with time, uh, we would call that cross-sectional data. If we're looking at data that goes across time, we would call that longitudinal data or time series data. And for that, we use a different technique. 
because time series has certain peculiarities methodologically, so it's not appropriate to use linear regression in its orthodox form on time series data. Panel data is when you've got time series and you've got cross-sectional data. And it's also called pooled time series. Now, a lot of the data editing can be done in SPSS using uh, up here transform at the top. You've got compute variable and recoding variables. I find it more versatile to do it in Excel. So I like to take the data out, and, uh, modify it in Excel, do the calculations, the transformations, and then bring it back in. But you can, you can do it uh, in here. Now, there are different kinds of data. There are nominal forms of data, and if we look at the variable view, you'll see here we've got some nominal types of data. Um, uh, they're not true nominal. Like we have settlement, for example, that is nominal. A nominal would be unranked values, like what city you're born in, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, Halifax. These are not ranked. There's no city that's better than another. They're simply names. Uh, linear regression does not analyze nominal data, either as a dependent or an independent variable. So here, these nominal values are, are really uh, ranked values. So Now, a dummy variable is a variable that's coded as 0 or 1 for the presence or the absence of a characteristic like nuclear weapons. Uh, it's very often used as a gender variable. Uh, you're either uh, one gender or the other uh, biologically when you're uh, asked in a survey. So the peculiarity of the math is we use 0 and 1, but you don't have to. If you were to assign other values like minus 36 and plus 2,000, it would produce the exact same result in the prediction. The math rebalances regardless of the values attributed, but it's just easier uh, if you're going to code the absence or presence of a factor to have it coded as 0 or 1. Now there are also interaction terms. These are peculiar applications. When you've got two variables that, when they interact, they create a wildly disproportionate effect. What you do is you, you leave the two variables in the model and you create a third variable by taking those two variables and multiplying them against each other. It could be, for example, a Great Depression mixed with a certain type of political system that produces a type of foreign policy that is far more extreme than would be produced individually by a certain political system or by a, a collapsed economy. So interaction effects are crude because we're just multiplying two variables together to capture an extraordinary effect in the dependent variable, but it works. Uh, and it doesn't always work, but it, it's, it's, it's a sort of an analogy, it's a powerful sponge for soaking up variance in the dependent variable when uh, a, a, um, a less extreme values in the independent variables individually don't capture that effect. We have, of course, ordinal level variables, which is what uh, some of the variables are here. Um, the MID hostility level, you know, going from no militarized action to the threat of force to the display of force to the use of force to war, that is ordinal because we don't have a set range of distance between each of the categories. Uh, it escalates in an, in an order. It goes from bronze, silver to gold, but it, we don't know the distances between those values. Where if we were to look at height, uh, five foot to six foot is one foot apart, six foot to seven foot is one foot apart. So here we're using real numbers and we have a, a precise sense of what the differences are between the heights. So ordinal uh, can be used by uh, linear regression. Linear regression prefers interval level data, but it'll use ordinal if there's lots of categories. And of course the best form of data is interval because it provides so much richness and detail, like the length of a war, the number of casualties, it's what we're always looking for, and uh, especially uh, you know, going back to military history, the information's not always there. It's difficult um, to find precise casualties in wars and battles uh, that are even occurring today, because we just don't have people on the ground being able to make those types of uh, counts. So interval level's good. What's very bad are uh, taking rich interval level data and breaking it down. If you have raw data in terms of casualties for a number of different wars, don't break them down into a table where you've got 
uh, 1 to 100 casualties is equal to the first category, and 101 to 700 is equal to the second category. You're losing data richness. Never, never break down data. The only time the data is broken down is for publication, when you're trying to translate translate complicated data to an audience that doesn't have the time to leaf through mountains of data. Um, but as far as you, the scholar, are concerned, uh, you know, it's, it's your job to be able to look at data, so never break data down. If you were to break data down and then put it into an Excel, uh, into a, a linear regression, you're going to lose a huge amount of valuable uh, information. Now, you can also create indices out of these different types of information. You can take a natural logarithm because it captures the declining marginal effect of the values in a variable. You can take moving averages. This is where when you've got a lot of data that changes over time, for example, you could take the time period before, after, and at, the, and, and at present and average them together and replace the time in the present with that data. It smooths out jagged curves and sometimes makes it easier to see long-term uh, trends. Uh, you could also uh, divide uh, data by the standard deviation to control for uh, high levels of variances. And in uh, dyadic analyses where you've got one country against another, say a stronger country attacking a weaker country, then you could divide one country's values into another and that'll give you a ratio or a proportion um, so you can compare the two. So that's the different kind of uh, data and we've opened up our data set or we've, we've inserted our data set if we're doing our own. So now we're going to begin the diagnostic process. There are requirements for linear regression to function. One of those requirements is the data be normal. And the way that we ensure that the data is normal is we do a skewness and kurtosis test. Now the independent variables should all be approximately normal in their distribution. They all should produce a bell curve. Otherwise, the findings of the ordinary least squares regression will be biased. Now, this does not apply to dichotomous variables, variables with two categories like the dummy variable, where you have or you don't have nuclear weapons. That's not going to be normal. Either the have and have not are going to be the same or they're going to be different. And if they're different, they're going to be skewed either left or right. You're not going to get a normal distribution with a variable that only has two categories. So we don't apply this test to dummy variables. So skewness is the measure, the extent to which the distribution is leaning to the left or leaning to the right. Like, the, you know, the Tower of Pisa is leaning to one side. Uh, this matters, right, because if it's leaning too far to, to, to one side or the other, it's not going to be normal. Kurtosis measures how flat or how high the distribution rises. So let's go ahead and uh, do the procedure. So you're going to go to Analyze up here a lot. That's where a lot of these commands uh, are contained. And we're going to go down to Descriptive Statistics, just over here. And we're going to go into Descriptives. And uh, we're going to open it up. Here, here we have a dialog box, right? We can always open up the dialog box bigger if uh, we don't have enough space, because we, you know, we're having difficulty reading the variables. So here we're going to input into this box of variables here the variables of interest, the independent variables, hostility, reciprocity, and fatality. Now, I'm putting reciprocity in there, even though I'm not supposed to, because I want you to see what it looks like. All right, now we're going to go to options and tick on kurtosis and skewness. Right? This is going to give us the uh, return. Now, normally we would click OK, but when we do time series, we're going to have to actually use uh, syntax, which is the code. So every other time you're going to click OK, but this first time I'm going to click paste and I'm going to show you what the syntax looks like. So this is the code. Sometimes, for the more complex procedures, we're going to need code. So how do we run it? Well, first of all, I need to make sure there's a period at the end of the code. You simply highlight the part of the code that you want, which in this case is all of it, and we hit the green arrow, or the green triangle. Boom! We've got our results. Now, there's a lot of information on the table, but the only information we care about is the statistic here at skewness and the statistic here at kurtosis. That's it. And the criteria is very simple we would like a value less than 1. If the value is less than 1, it's definitely normal. It's tolerable if it's between 1 and 2. And if the value is greater than 2, then it is not normal. Now, what's the consequence of that? Well, it's going to bias the results. 
we should tell the readers that because that the uh, requirement of normal distribution of data is not met, that the results could be biased. Which means, you know, we don't know the direction of it. It could increase or decrease the strength of our uh, ability to make a prediction. Right? Well, it won't, it won't strengthen our ability to make a prediction. It'll uh, strengthen the prediction itself falsely. But we don't know. We don't know. It could understate or overstate the relationship. So here we, uh, you know, we've got some problems. If you look at hostility, uh, the statistic is negative. Negative skewness means it leans to the left. Positive skewness means it leans to the right. Uh, negative kurtosis means it's flat. Positive kurtosis means it's very peaked. So here we have hostility. It's, it's over uh, minus one, uh, which means it's leaning to the left. And it's just, just outside the range of optimally normal, but it's tolerable. And it's, it's kurtosic, uh, which means it's, it's peaked, uh, slightly above normality. Reciprocity has got very normal skewness, but unfortunately it's beyond, just, just, just beyond the range of kurtosis. It's just very, very flat. And uh, of course this is predicted because reciprocity, of course, is a dummy variable, so we would expect it not to be normal. Fatality is uh, tolerably normal, uh, leaning uh, to the left, and it's not normal in terms of its kurtosis. It's, it's uh, very, very peaked. And this could be because you've got some very extreme wars that have a lot of uh, fatalities, and most wars have very few fatalities. Um, and so this is just the nature of the data. Now, the, the normal solution to these problems is get more data. If you're running a survey company, go out and interview more people. But as international relations scholars, we can't make up more wars. We could certainly go back in time and try to research more wars, but maybe that'll be outside the scope conditions. Maybe researching conflicts before Napoleon uh, couldn't be generalizable because society was so different before the uh, 19th century. So uh, we have to move on and, and take note of the fact that some of the variables here are uh, problematic. And there's not much we can do about it because we can't make more disputes up. So now we go on to step three. A major issue is multicollinearity. Multicollinearity. We need to ensure that the independent variables are distinct from each other. Ordinary least squares regression will not work if the independent variables are the same. Now, why would independent variables be the same? Right? Multicollinearity comes from linear algebra and uh, its analysis of, of uh, 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 being collinear, which means having parallel values. The problem typically is you have a common prior cause. You have, for example, an economic collapse. An economic collapse both causes deflation and it causes unemployment. And it, when you put unemployment and deflation in the model, they end up being multicollinear because they can predict each other very, very efficiently. But they're not the same thing. They're different things, but they're caused by the same thing that happened before, the same antecedent variable, the same common prior cause. So um, that's a problem because it'll bias the model. If you run a model and you were to measure my height in centimeters and my height in inches, you'd also have a problem because those two would produce almost the same result. You'd have a high level of multicollinearity. For linear regression, our threshold is no two independent variables can be associated more than 75% or more than 0.75 in their Pearson R. So let's go run it. So we go to Analyze, and we've already done this. This was actually the bivariate two variable uh, regression that we did by hand. So uh, we go to Analyze, Correlate, Bivariate. Bivariate means uh, two variables. But we're throwing all the variables in because we're going to end up with a matrix. So we're going to put in hostility, reciprocity, and fatality. We're not putting in the dependent variable because, uh, well, we don't have to. Because the dependent variable, of course, we want it to relate to the independent variables. It's the independent variables that we don't want to relate to each other. So we click OK. So again, there's a lot of information on this table. We don't need most of it. The only values we need are the Pearson correlation. Everything else can be disregarded. Now, I want to make a point here. These are tables being generated on the output file. If you want to save it, 
you can, but if you want to export it, you're going to have to copy and paste special. You can't just do a normal copy paste. So you copy and paste these into a file and then bring them with you. But for the papers that you do for class, do not reproduce these tables in your paper. When you do your paper critique, you're going to see the format that people use in scholarly papers. Use those formats. The formats that you see in the papers that you read in the journals and the paper that you have to critique. Model your paper uh, after those types of presentations. Do not use these SPSS tables that frankly are, are never used because uh, they have way too much information and they distract. So let's take a look at the correlations here. We've got hostility and of course hostility correlates with itself perfectly on a 1. So let's look now hostility and reciprocity. Here we've got a 0.3. This is good. It's less than a 0 0.75. These two variables are not the same. Let's look at hostility and fatality. It's 0 0.042. There's very little common variance between these. So all these variables satisfy the requirement of being less related than 0.75, which is good. Now, what would we do if they were related? Well, the, the solution is you have to exclude one of the independent variables. A second one is to somehow combine the two variables. And a third solution, which is uh, hideously ugly, is factor analysis, which is a brutal uh, esoteric technique that rips variables apart, puts them back together in new ways uh, in order to increase uh, uh, the uh, amount of variance explained. The problem with factor analysis is that it's so esoteric and arcane that it's almost impossible to explain to people what it is. So if you were to take our three variables, hostility, reciprocity, and fatality, and turn them into three factor-analyzed factors, you would not be able to explain to the stakeholder who paid for your report what they mean. So we generally use factor analysis when we're concerned with making predictions, like in polling. We don't use it in international relations where we have a significant burden in trying to explain what is happening. When we're trying to explain stuff, Stay away from factor analysis unless you know exactly what factor analysis is doing. So we've satisfied this third requirement. Now we have to go on to the fourth requirement. The fourth requirement is the scatter plot. We need to make sure that there is no non-linearity. No non-linearity. What does that mean? It means we don't care if we see a random relationship. We like linear relationships. What we do not want to see is a curved relationship. Why? Because it's linear regression. We're trapped by, unfortunately, the low technological level of our math. We can only make predictions on a line. If we superimpose a line of best fit, a regression line, on curved data, then we're going to wildly mispredict some of those values. So we can only deal with linear associations. I know it's a terrible limitation and one day we'll find a better solution but uh, uh, we're trapped at the moment. S statistics is not quite as advanced as you may think. So what we're going to do is we're going to scatter plot and we're going to take a visual ocular trauma test. We're going to look at some graphs and see what type of relationship there is. If the uh, independent variable uh, has a nonlinear relationship, we have to go fix it. That's called a transformation. We have to transform the data into a better shape. We never transform the dependent variable, only the independent variables, because if we transform the dependent variable, then we have to recheck it again with the independent variables. It becomes a giant mess. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to go to graphs. And we're going to go to graphs a lot because there's lots of useful uh, instruments here. So we go to legacy dialogues. That, that means uh, dialog boxes for old people like me. I've been using SPSS for almost 30 years, if you can imagine that. So scatter dot, we've got the matrix, which is good. A, a simple is just one uh, variable uh, juxtaposed against another, and we get a scatter. But uh, matrix allows us to put many variables together, although the table is less clearly defined. So into the matrix, we're going to throw in all of the variables, including the dependent variable, because uh, we want to see the relationship but of the dependent variable to the independent variables. So here we've got hostility, reciprocity, and fatality. So um, we're going to click OK. Let's see what happens. 
So sometimes it'll take a, a few seconds for the um, data to appear. So here we have um, outcome. Obviously, outcome has no uh, interaction with itself. Outcome on hostility. It looks just like a grid of dots, right? This is what happens when you've got just a few categories. It's very hard to distinguish. It doesn't look like there's any curved relationship here. Reciprocity has only got two values. It's either on or off. Uh, either there's reciprocity or not. So there's no information there. And when we look at outcome and fatality, we've got a bunch of dots on one side and a bunch of dots on the other, but it looks like there's no curved relationship there. So we're fortunate, right? But imagine that there was a curved relationship. If there was a curved relationship, we would have to transform the data. So what we're going to do right now is take a short leave of this data set. We're going to open up a new data set. So I can show you how you would do a transformation if you're going to do a transformation. Okay, so here's just a couple of rules uh, for when you're doing a transformation. Let's go uh, first get the data. Open uh, data. I'm going to pick up uh, data that's completely unrelated to international relations. I'm picking up data called anxiety. All right. Anxiety has got two variables. It's got anxiety, which is measured from 1 to 10 before you took a test. And it's got your uh, exam results. And it's got it for 73 uh, individuals. All right. So we've got a bivariate relationship here. Okay. So there's different kind of curves with different kinds of solutions. If we have an F-curve, and you can imagine an F-curve is something that stops, starts on the bottom left and then works its way up and it goes to the top right, then you get the log. So how would we do that? Well, you would go into Transform, Compute. And look, here's got this amazing instrument that allows you to make transformations. So we could take, uh, you know, click on arithmetic here and bring in log 10. Here's log 10. And we would drop into log 10 uh, anxiety. And we could call this log anxiety. All right, low, low ganks, right? And uh, boom, we click OK. And when we go to look at our data, whoa, look, we've got this new variable called low ganks, which we've created. And we can then run a model. And if we had this F curve, when we plotted it, by, put it, by having this transformation of the independent variable, we would have solved the problem. If we have an L curve, then we would transform the independent variable on the x-axis into its reciprocal. This means you would put 1 on top of all the values and divide the values into the numerator. So take all the independent numbers, put a 1 on top, and then divide. Uh, it's messy. The third is, if you have a bell curve, then you would use the quadratic. A bell curve, you know, it looks like a little mountain. A quadratic is a complicated way of saying just multiply the value, the variable's values by itself. And a cubic is multiply it by itself three times. Right? The more times you multiply it, the more you're going to get rid of that little mountain shape. If you have a z-curve, then you would get the log of both the dependent variable and the independent variable. But this is messy, very, very messy. There's no question that uh, transformations are time consuming, and they benefit from trial and error, and the solutions are rarely perfect. Now, in the good old days, before we had calculators, people would use logarithms to make calculations. Because when you add and subtract logarithms, it's the equivalent of multiplying very large numbers. And so uh, people knew a lot about logs, about two generations before our present time. Uh, and these are the rules of logs, which is they don't work with negative numbers or zeros. So if you have to log a zero, uh, log a very, very small number, like 0.1, or just log 1 itself. And of course, don't log negative numbers. You'll have to shift the whole scale to make sure there are no negative numbers. So logs can be uh, cantankerous. And once you've done the transformation, you have to go back and check to see how well you succeeded. So let's go ahead and make a transformation. All right. First of all, uh, let's check the what it looks like. Let's go to the scatter dot. Let's go to the simple scatter this time. All right. So we're just going to put two variables in there. The y-axis is always, of course, the dependent variable. The x-axis is always the independent variable. So we're going to put anxiety explaining exams. What do we see here? Well, that looks like a normal curve, which is bad, <laughs> right? Because we, we don't want uh, any curves in the scatter plot. We got to get rid of this. So let's, let's make a transformation. Let's do what we're supposed to do, which is take the quadratic, or multiply the variable against itself. So we go to transform, we go to compute variable. Let's get rid of this logarithm. We don't need it anymore. So I'm going to put, I'm going to call a new, new uh, 
uh, I'm going to call it QQ Xi. QQ Xi, that's uh, uh, the quadratic of anxiety. So I'm going to move anxiety up, put an asterisk in for a multiplication, put another anxiety, and I'm going to click OK. And when I go to this, I see here, look, I've created this new QQ quant. See here, I've got my new variable. So let's go and see what we do. Let's go graph legacy dialog. Go down to scatter dot, simple, define. Let's throw out anxiety, throw in our new variable, and see what happened. Oi, it's still bad. Not so bad. It, it's, it's basically shifting the apex to the left. Let's, let's get more extreme. Let's, let's put in the cubic. So we're going to multiply this thing by three times. I'm going to put another Q at the front. So we're going to have Q, 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 angsty. Click OK. Let's go graph this thing. What does it look like? I hate to think what it's going to look like. All right, we get rid of QQ and we put in QQQ. And it's not much better. Well, it's better. It's better. It's less, less curved. It's shifted the peak all the way to the left. And so it's basically denuded the right side uh, elevation with dots. So it, we've got much fewer dots. So at least most of the data is being less involved in the curved portion. So this is a poor improvement, but some improvement. All right, so um, that takes us uh, that far. The next step is we don't want Wonder Woman in our data set. Now, what does that mean? If we're doing a health study, we don't want to have in the study, you can close this, we're not going to need any more uh, transformations. Um, we don't want extreme outlier cases. As you know, as we saw before, 68% um, of individuals fit within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% within two standard deviations, and 99% within three standard deviations. Pluto right now doesn't have much of an effect on, on this uh, statistical program because the gravitational pull of Pluto uh, is it's almost unmeasurable. You know, we can see it, but we can't, we can't feel its gravity. However, in linear regression, if Pluto was a case study, and it's way out there, probably several hundred standard deviations away, and I attached a rubber band to Pluto, Pluto would pull my, my broom handle way off course. So unlike the gravity of the planets, which diminishes with distance, outliers have a huge disruptive biased impact because of the, the math of reducing and minimizing the sum of least squares. Remember, you've got these rubber bands that go from the nail to the broom handle, and collectively those rubber bands have tensions. And what the math is trying to do is trying to minimize this, the sum of squares of all of those rubber bands. But if we have one rubber band that goes way out to Pluto or, or to uh, a superhuman person like Wonder Woman, then we've got a problem. Right? We're going to be uh, damaging and undermining uh, our results. So we need to temporarily exclude extreme values. Okay. Uh, now, we can do this two ways. We can do this visually. Uh, or we can do this by looking at the uh, standard deviations themselves. But let's you know let's start with looking at uh, looking at the problem graphically. So we go to graphs, legacy dialogues. We're going to go down to histogram, and what we're going to do is we're going to put each of the uh, we're going to click display normal curve. We're going to take each of our independent variables and drag them through. In fact, we're also going to drag our our dependent variable through as well. Outcome. We'll see how many extreme outcomes there are. Let's click OK. Does that look normal to you? Yeah. That looks normal. OK, legacy dialog for the next variable, histogram. Let's get rid of outcome, and let's put in the next variable of, well, reciprocity, of course, will be meaningless, uh, because it's only got two categories. So let's put in hostility, see what happens. Yeah. Let's put in Fatality. Mm, well, this one's got some uh, peculiar stuff. This is a uh, 
quite far down in terms of raw value. So this is a, a yeah, that's quite far. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is to convert uh, this data into data that we can read in terms of standard deviations. Okay. So we're going to go to analyze. We're going to go to descriptive statistics. We're going to go to descriptives. Okay. And descriptives we're going to click Save Standardized Values as Variables. So this is going to give us our standard deviations for all of these independent variables. We don't actually need reciprocity. That's just going to confuse everybody. Uh, we are going to put outcome the dependent variable in there. So what are we looking for? We're looking for some crazy numbers. All right, We're looking for stuff that's uh, way out there in terms of standard deviations. So remember, uh, one standard deviation two standard deviations, that's normal. Here, here we got a minus two. That means it's 2.6 2 standard deviations below the mean. That happens. All right, we got one stand, 1.9 standard deviations there. Uh, twos here, ones, twos. Uh, oh, it's sort of flying down here. Da, 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 da. Let's pick up the pace because we have 2,000 data points. So if we fly through here, we could probably do some sort of Boolean search but I like to just, you know, scan through these things to look for stuff. If we get a number that's zero, we know that number is at the mean. If it's negative, it's to the left. If it's positive, it's to the right. And I don't see anything above uh, above three. Everything is up to two, and that's sort of what we would predict. Overwhelmingly, most of the wars are going to, you know, fit within the bell curve. And uh, I don't see anything here that's out past three standard deviations. That's great. That's fantastic. So um, we have normality. This is good. We have no what we would call outliers, no extreme cases that are bending our line of best fit far out from uh, what would be considered uh, normal. So things are good because we've now completed all of the diagnostics necessary. Now, we do have this problem, you know, if, if you have outliers and you exclude them and you rerun the model and the model is very different, then uh, you would conclude that those outliers are having a significant effect and you would exclude them from the model. But if you take out everything that's two standard deviations or greater and run the model, you're going to find that uh, the bell curve is going to rebalance itself and will repopulate anything outside of two standard deviations and you're going to have to rerun and then re-exclude. And this goes on infinitely until you run out of data points. So you only do this once and you only do it once with the extreme values. So finally we're ready. Let's go run the linear regression. So how do we do that? We go up to analyze, we go down to regression, we go to linear and here we are. So there's a couple of uh, things we have to do here. Um, we first of all have to put in the dependent variable. There can only be one dependent variable and here it goes. And we're going to put the three independent variables into the independent box. So that would be hostility, reciprocity, and fatality. And they're all in. But we're not done yet. We need to do diagnostics. So we're going to go to save. And there's two groups of saves here. There's predicted values on the left and residuals on the right. Predicted values are where they're the y hat values that are located on the regression line. It's where we predict things are going to happen. And they're they're all located on that line because of the limitations of regression. We can't reproduce a scattered plot of predictions. The residuals are the rubber bands. They're the errors. They're the mistakes. They're the distance between where the nail is, the, the data uh, spot on the scatter plot and where uh, where the line of regression is and there's there's almost always an error for each individual case and of course we sum up those errors and the whole algorithm of linear regression is to minimize the squared distances the square residuals but we can also use these to do special diagnostics that we're going to show you after we run the regression so what are we going to save in the predicted box we're going to save the standardized um, values. The standardized predicted values and the unstandardized predicted values. Standardized means we forced it into a normal curve and the values will have z-scores. They're going to have values that are above and below the, the, the mean in terms of standard deviations. Unstandardized will be the raw scores of the data. Now for the residuals, we're going to save the 
unstandardized and not the stand not the standardized but the studentized. You might remember student uh, as the individual from Guinness Beer who counted the middle fingers of uh, British prisoners to create the t test table. So we're going to save those two. We're all and we so we click continue. We're also going to save a plot. Now in the plot we're going to put into the y the standardized predicted value. Okay? And this would be Z pred. Z means standardized. And we're going to put SD red. SD red is studentized residual. It used to be called SRE, but it's SDR. Studentized residual, which is again that individual from uh, Guinness Beer. And here we are. We click continue and we click OK. Boom! Here are the results. Now there's a lot of information here, most of which we don't need. But let's focus in on the, the uh, items that matter. Most importantly, the model summary at the top, we have here the R-squared, 0 0.034. 0 0.034 is actually a fairly dreadful result. It indicates that only 3.4% of the variation in the dependent variable can be explained by the independent variables. But it's, uh, it's what you have. But we can't use R-squared. R-squared is what you'd use if you had a bivariate model. So we have to use the adjusted R-squared the adjusted R-squared compensates for phenomenon where when we throw lots of independent variables on top of each other in a model, they actually artificially inflate the total amount of variance explained. So the adjusted R-squared is a more conservative estimate and therefore typically a smaller value. And so the real value is we're only explaining 3.3% of the variation in the dependent variable from the independent variables. This is a, a very weak result. A strong result would have been 0.6, like a 60%. That would be a very strong result. You're almost never going to get a 70% or an 80%, a 0.8 or a 0.9 in the social sciences just because of the complexity of the social sciences. There's so many variables at play that decision makers are almost never have an easy decision. So let's go on now to the ANOVA, the analysis of variance. This is the F statistic. You recall the F statistic. We looked at it when we uh, were doing the hand regression. So this provides a general estimate of the significance of the model's findings. It tells us whether we can generalize about the whole model from the sample, which is the 2,000 cases we have here, to the entire universe. Now, some political scientists argue, well, you know what? We have here the universe of cases. We have all the disputes from Napoleon to a recent date. So, you know, what are we generalizing to? We already have everything. Well, the thing is, uh, philosophically speaking, we could use this to generalize into the past, we could use this to generalize in the future, and we could use this to generalize into alternate realities in the present. So even though it's not formally useful to generalize because we have every single event that could possibly occur. So we're not really looking at a sample, we're actually looking at a population. This, so this, this test would be better if we were, for example, looking at wars in Europe and then trying to generalize from Europe to the rest of the world. But here we have the entire world cases. But from a philosophic standpoint, we're also checking to see if it's a false positive. We're checking to see if it's a coincidence, probabilistically speaking. So we still use the F-test, and it's still valid, even if we have every case that we could possibly find in the data set. So we have here the degrees of freedom, which is typically the number of cases minus the intercept, which brings us down to 2,041 cases, minus the three independent variables, which brings us down to 2,038 cases. And so that's the number of cases that we're going to bring to the table. And we have, uh, uh, from that, the F statistics that's generated from the table. And then we have the significance. So how do we interpret the significance? Well, uh, the F statistic is an inferential statistic. It seeks to determine whether we can extrapolate from our sample of cases to all cases in the past, future, or another region. It's important because it tells us whether we can extrapolate from our model to other places where the phenomenon it hap is happening. So. Uh, the assumption of all inferential statistics is that there is no relationship. Remember, we can't prove anything. We can only disprove. So we call this the null or zero hypothesis. That, that you know, nothing's happening. We always assume nothing's happening. What the F statistic tries to do is falsify this assertion. 
right? Because you can't prove anything. So it tries to falsify the idea that nothing's happening. And by successfully falsifying that there is nothing happening, that there's no false positive, we know we can extrapolate and therefore generalize our model. So in the social sciences, we typically go with a threshold of 95% confidence that the null is, fal is, is falsified, which turns into a, uh, a significance test of 0 0.05. So we look at this significance here, and we see it's 0 0.000. That is great! That's the significance is the probability that we're looking at a false positive. If this was anything higher than 0 0.05, we would have failed the test. So this tells us that, you know what, the model's not very powerful, it only explains 3.3%, but it is incredibly robust. We are very, very confident about that 3.3%. It is not a false positive, it is not a coincidence, uh, it is going to be generalizable to, to, uh, to the larger uh, population of cases. So the F, F statistic is important. It tells us about the whole model. Okay, now, um, the 5% is pretty hard. And I've never seen a social scientific study that uses anything higher than 5%. So that's really the cutoff. So let's look now at the next table. This is the richest table. The coefficients table, every single thing on this table almost is useful. Let's start off with the simplest part of the table. And it's, you know, it's just, it's horrible where they put it, the beta the standardized coefficients. We call this in, in calculus the partial r. The partial r in calculus when you're doing derivatives is uh, something you know magical. What it allows you to do is to freeze all the other variables and then to, and to, and then to oscillate or change the values of the variable you're interested in. So it allows you to get a perspective on how much effect that one variable has. Right? I mean, it, wouldn't that be uh, you know, wonderful in real life if we, if we could, ceteris paribus, hold other things equal so we could look at our variables? The statistics does this for us. Qualitatively, it's very difficult. But here, instantly, because of calculus, we can do it. So these are standardized, which means uh, they're forced into a bell curve. So uh, the, term, term, the number values are, uh, they're, they're not unstandardized. They're not the direct values. They're sort of made so they're comparative. So here, magnitude matters. The negative sign doesn't really mean anything. It just means there's an inverse relationship, but uh, which doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean weak or strong. It just says as one value goes up, the other one goes down between the, the independent and the dependent variable. So the magnitudes are important. So we can see here that reciprocity is at 0.15. It explains the most, followed by fatality at 0.08, followed by hostility at 0.05. That's the only thing we can say about it. That's all we can say. Now, the second value of this table is the B coefficients. These are unstandardized coefficients. They're the raw scores that went in from the data set. And we have here the constant on top. The constant is the y-intercept. We're going to need this later on when we create our regression equation, which you already saw when we did our hand regression. This will allow us to make predictions. So we'll just remember the constant is the y-intercept. All the other values for the constant are irrelevant. We're never, ever going to use them. So let's look at the B coefficients for hostility, reciprocity, and fatality. Those three values are the slopes we're going to use for the regression equation later on. But for now, this is what we can do with it. You take the B coefficient, say for hostility, minus 0.136, you divide it by its standard error. 0.136 divided by 0.055, and you leap over the beta, gives you the T value. Here's the t-value, minus 2.486. Look at that. So minus 0.136 divided by 0 0.055 is equal to minus 2.486. And we can take this t-value, again, from the, the gentleman from the Guinness Beer Company. We take it at the t-table, and we can check the significance on the table. But we don't have to, because here the computer does all of that for us automatically. So we can see, for hostility, we have a 0.013. That means the threshold here is 1.3%. Remember, it's less than 5%, which means this is good. It means we're, we're, we have the ability to generalize. Now, the t-statistic tells us the likelihood that we can generalize the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. Um, not the whole model, but just that variable. And, and this variable is good. We can generalize and, uh, with, with, with confidence. For reciprocity, same thing. 0.437 divided by 0 0.068 is equal to 6.463, gives us a significance of 0 0.000. We are highly confident that there's no false positive. This is a good thing. We can generalize reciprocity. And fatality, minus 0 0.035 divided by 0 0.009 gives us minus 3.641.
Again, significance of 0 0.000. We are highly confident that this can be generalized. Now let's take a look at uh, you know let's take a look back at uh, some of the uh, stuff. This here is just out of curiosity a very strange uh, distribution. It's the f statistic, right? This is the distribution of the f statistic. It's like a, it's like height, right? There's no negative height, and most people uh, are not that tall, and so you have a clustering at the beginning, right? This here is the f statistic, and we can we can use this table if we wanted to. We can see at the top here that we're already dealing with the five percent uh, table. We don't have an infinite number of cases. We have 120, so we would uh, take the 120 row because we've got 2,000 cases, which is less than infinity but more than 120, and we want to be conservative. And we have three independent variables, so we would take the column of three. So we look down column three, and we get here a 2.68. So this is a rule of thumb. This is the critical value. Um, now, uh, SPSS has already calculated this for us, and here on the table we would calculate the F statistic, uh, and we would say, well, is it is is the value calculated bigger than the value on the table? And if it is, it's significant. But the uh, the F statistic in SPSS gives us the significance directly. Here you can see a student's T compared with the z distribution. The z distribution uh, is the standard normal curve. And when we standardize things, this is what it looks like, this blue peaked uh, normal curve. T's distribution has a different shape depending on how many cases it has. So when you have n smaller than 30, less than 30 cases, you've got this um, mauve, I guess, color. Uh, and then you've got this magenta color when you've got n as it approaches 30. So here's the t-table. This doesn't look like the t-table you used before. When we're doing a t-test and we're not sure of the direction of the relationship, we're going to take the two-sided test. Now remember, we're going to do the 5% because that's the standard threshold in the social sciences. So we're going to take the 5% column for the two-sided. Now the degrees of freedom depends on the number of cases. And again, we don't have an infinite number of cases. We've got more than 120, but less than infinity. So we would settle on a number here that's about 1.98. But I want to draw your attention to the number above that, which is 2.000, which is the intersection of 5% and 60. So 5% and 60, that's a number of 2.000. And this is to the rule of thumb, which is when you get to a value of 2, and you've got a fair number of cases, you're looking at a fairly high level of confidence that your values are significant if they reach the value of 2. So that's how to read those tables. So uh, we're not done running diagnostics. Okay. So if we had some variables that were not significant, we would take them out. We would rerun the model. Um, but what we need to do now is test for hetero Skedasticity. Say it with me. Heteroscedasticity. And again, heteroscedasticity. Homoscedasticity is good. Heteroscedasticity is bad. It's a dysfunction. Heteroscedasticity occurs when there's a pattern in the residuals, specifically when the standard deviations of the residuals are uneven. This usually happens when there is a hidden pattern within the data, usually caused by a missing independent variable. This is called omitted variable bias. If you have a model and you're missing a very obvious variable that has huge effects, that, and we would expect it to have huge effects, believe it or not, the regression is going to show a shadow. And the shadow doesn't appear as a variable, it appears as a pattern when you're looking at heteroscedasticity. So let's first take a look at what heteroscedasticity would look like. Heteroscedasticity is going to look very different from homoscedasticity. Homoscedasticity is going to give you a standard distribution. If you look here at panel A on the left, you'll see you've got a scattering of, of, of data points and they basically follow a line. In panel B, we have an increasing amount of variance across from left to right, sort of a trumpet shape. In panel C, we see a reversed trumpet shape, where a decreasing variance going from left to right. And in panel D, we can see a bow tie effect, 
where it's most concentrated at the center. These could be seasonal effects where perhaps there's winter growing season and so you get less variation in the type of plants that are growing and then in the summer you have much greater variation. And so we didn't model seasonality, we excluded the variable, we have omitted variable bias and so we end up with this sh shadow in the, the uh, scatter plot which indicates to us that there is something that we missed. So let's take a look uh, here at another representation. You've got here on the left A, uh, what looks like a normal distribution. This is homoscedasticity with a large sample. B here is homoscedasticity with a small sample. It looks a bit more normal. You do have taperings at the uh, edge, left and right. But panel C is definitely heteroscedasticity. Now with the panels on the right, the panel A uh, is uh, normal assumptions. Uh, B, you see a failure of normality. So you've got some variables in there that are not normally distributed. C is definitely a non-linear relationship. And D is heteroscedasticity. You've got that uh, easily recognizable trumpet shape. So let's go see what we have. All right, so here we... Uh, uh, plotted the standardized predicted value against the studentized, which is sort of a form of standardized residual. And do we see a pattern here? No, that looks pretty, uh, pretty uh, evenly distributed. It looks, uh, looks pretty good to me. Now, another use of heteroscedasticity is the method of testing the equality of the variance assumption. The error term, or the residual, this is the rubber band, has a zero mean and is normally distributed. And so regressing the studentized residuals and the standardized predicted values should show no pattern. Right? And here we see no pattern, so all is good. The studentized residuals should also be regressed against each independent variable. And, uh, well, we can do that. We can do that right now. Okay, so we're going to go to graphs. Legacy dialogues, scatter dot, matrix scatter. Now we're going to lose, because we're doing a matrix uh, here, we're going to lose some of the uh, detail. But we've thrown in um, our independent variables. We, we don't need outcome, we just need our independent variables. We're going to throw in SRE, studentized residuals. Now remember, if you can't see the variables, you can always widen your dialog box. So we throw in a studentized residuals, we click OK. And, well, obviously for reciprocity, it's a dummy variable. We're not going to get any data there. Um, fatality doesn't look too good, actually. Fatality looks a little bit unhappy. Because you've got this increasing variance here on the right. But it, there's so few data points, it's very hard to say. I mean, there's 2,000 data points, but it's, there's not a lot of variation here. The rest looks fine. So fatality, a question mark. So what would we have to do? Well, the solution for homoscedasticity is go insert the missing variable, right? Solve your omitted variable bias. Another solution is weighted least squares regression. It's a kind of diagnostic uh, uh, solution to the problem of heteroscedasticity. So let's go now to our regression equation. You might recall we have here the coefficients. So you would write down the coefficients uh, of hostility, reciprocity, and fatality, and you'd include the constant, which I've done here. These are the same values. And so we can produce a regression equation. And this gives us a lot of power because it allows us to make predictions. This is very valuable. So uh, we have here the constant, which of course is the uh, y-intercept plus hostility times the coefficient plus reciprocity times its coefficient plus fatality times its coefficient equals the outcome. So here I've come up with a sample. Here I have a hostility level 5, which is war. I have reciprocity. So these two countries are not interacting in, in, a, in a way that uh, you have dialogue. They're basically attacking each other. And you have a fatality of 4, which is 400 killed, which is a fairly large border engagement. So plugging all these values in, we get the result of 4.816, uh, which tells us that uh, outcome at value 4 is that one side is going to give up to the other side when you've got this level of violence. So that's the application. Now, I want to just uh, read off the last paragraph in the notes. And this comes from Bremer, who is one of the authors that you had to read. And it's about the utility of generating predicted values. So we can use this, this uh, prediction equation 
to do a sensitivity analysis of our results. So statistical findings are often reported in terms of their measures of association, like an R squared. And this model was pretty dreadful, if you recall, it was 3.3%. Or regression uh, coefficients. You know, we could say that hostility or reciprocity or fatality are uh, significant. And, and all of them are, in fact, uh, significant. We could also report the betas, which will allow us to rank these different uh, variables in terms of their effects on the dependent variable. An alternative method used frequently, such as in our readings, uh, is to use the regression equation to create predictions. So how would we do this? Well, the procedure is set the independent variable values at the desired level of the effect, usually at the lowest value level, which, which would capture the absence of the effect, and then calculate the outcome value. If the focus is on a single variable in the multivariate model, the other var variables should set their, to their mode, which is the most common value, or to their mean, which is the middle value. So if you were very interested in hostility, you, you would set reciprocity to its average, which would, of course, be impossible, because reciprocity only has two values, and fatality to its average. All right? So then you would set the independent vari variable values at the subsequent desired level of the effect, usually the highest value level, and then calculate the outcome value. If the focus is on a single variable in a multivariate model, the other variables may be set to their mode. So this would mean that we would set hostility, which is the variable of interest, to its highest value, and to its lowest value. We would run two separate prediction equations, and then we would see, well, what is the difference in the outcome? We would then divide the lowest value into the highest value, and this would give us a ratio of how many times the bigger value is bigger than the smaller value. Right? This would give us sort of an odds value. So we could say, well, you know what, when hostility is high, compared to when hostility is low, you're going to have uh, three times uh, more violence in the outcome. So that's the kind of comparison we make. It's, it's a ratio of the effect from the individual variables. So if we wanted the same thing with reciprocity, um, we would put hostility and fatality at their average or their mode, and then we'd oscillate reciprocity between, their, between its high value and its low value, and then we'd look at the dependent variable and see what, see what happened there. Maybe there's a big difference, maybe there isn't. Because it's very intuitive to tell someone uh, if there's reciprocity versus there's no reciprocity, you're three times more likely to get a high value on outcome. That is very intuitive. So for example, contiguous states are 35 times more likely to go to war than states that are not contiguous. That type of estimation from Bremer comes from that type of analysis where the contiguity of a state was measured at its highest value, its lowest value, and then they were divided into each other. So this concludes the discussion of the linear regression.